brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Oh, the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I One of the greatest songs. It is so neat. It's great to be with you guys this morning. We are still up in Chatteroy, and I give a shout out from uh, up here. It is gorgeous. It is uh, uh, kind of icy snow out there that's melting away. It's uh, overcast. Got up this morning early, uh, let the puppies out, walked with them a bit around the yard, and uh, it was a little foggy, but it was uh, it was all right. So. Uh, uh, we are back. We are. I'm sitting in their dining room and uh, give a shout out to all of you. This is the first chance we've had to see Chris since he uh, got through all of his testing and and came out and and soon he'll have uh, flight plans and he'll be in the air for Delta. We're very proud of him and thank you all for praying for him uh, during that period of time because there was a lot of testing and a lot of things going on. So. Uh, I come to you. We have not uh, had a chance to see them since uh, Thanksgiving time, so it uh, gives us an opportunity to come up and say hi to them. Things are going well or better in the uh, uh, Parson household as uh, they're trying to get uh, you know, uh, Riley's system calmed down, find out exactly everything that's going on there, and I'm going to try and get this adjusted so there's no... Uh, uh, glares coming through, but it is great. It's good to be with you today and uh, be able to open up the precious Word of God uh, with you this morning. And I pray that uh, God in His great wisdom and power will reveal Himself to each and every one of us today. And I want to give a shout out and a hi to those who have signed in and plugged in, and I know your name there. I know some of you that don't type in there, like uh, Mary that I met on Sunday. So if you're out there, Mary, God bless bless you. It is good to have you here with us. And uh, it was a joy to worship with you Sunday and have you there. So uh, I just pray that uh, God in his great mercy 
will show himself so powerful to all of us today. Uh, good morning, Miss Terry. You were the first one, and we always get our little I loves you up there, and I like that. So good morning to you. Good to have Terry back, isn't it? It was nice you got to go to Texas and see family, but it was sure nice to get her back and see her up there. And uh, then we had Buddy and Julia over in uh, Georgia. It's good to see you. I love you guys. You're constantly on my heart and prayer. Praise the Lord, a beautiful day he's made. And I pray it is a beautiful day in your neighborhood. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful day every day God gives us. Some days it's a little brighter and sunnier uh, than others, but it's still a great day because God has made it. He's given it to us, and as the command says, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And there's Miss Carolyn down in Tualatin. We love you, girl. It's good to see you up there this morning, and uh, a joy also to worship on Sunday with her and, and, and Sue, who's there with her big bunny too. It's good to see you. I got your email, and uh, I thought I had mailed you a copy of that. I pray that uh, if you didn't get it, I'll make sure I run one off for you. I answered your email, but I'll tell you, since you're up there, I'll run another one off for you and get it to you on Sunday, uh, but uh, i I I thought I'd mailed it, but that's okay. Things get get lost, but I'll get you one, all right? And there's my Miss Sherry upstairs uh, above me, and uh, she's got the puppies up there. And Miss Ruth, good morning to you, and give a shout-out. Hi to your lovely husband, Ken, and uh, Lena, good morning to you and Rick. It's good to see you. I pray you're still you're feeling better and that the, the eye is, is not bothering you so much today. But it's good to have you all. It's good for everybody to be back here. Now, yesterday, uh, it's kind of nice. The holidays, you know, things kind of leveled off and, 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 you know, everybody busy and attendance started to, uh, to join it. But, but after the holidays, everything is picking up. And uh, it's good to have so many back, you know, with us after this time. I know that... Uh, uh, the the Bailey's well they've got uh, they've got school today so uh, that's where they are on this Tuesday and so many others at any rate let's get back uh, yesterday we we really spent some more time overviewing the the cycle of prayer uh, and uh, you know went over it, trying to answer some questions that had come up since that period of time after we went through it in detail on Friday. Uh, a lot more questions came, and and we tried to uh, to 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 take those and answer those. I hadn't intended to spend so much time on that yesterday, but I would rather spend that time answering your questions and uh, digging in deeper. Like we've we've always said, these studies are not meant to be a sprint. They are a marathon. They are. We want to get in. We want to take. Uh, 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 the pieces, uh, you know, piece at a time. If there's an area that we need to go down to, you know, that, that leads us down, we're going to take that track, we're going to explore it, and we are going to learn, and we are going to grow in our relationship with God. So uh, what we want to do now is simply go back. You know, it's, you know I want you to consider this kind of like a river. Have you ever seen a massive river? Sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, the, it will split, and there'll be, you know, kind of a, a, a tributary. It'll go off in a direction and round about and come back around. You might have a little island there between the river and, and where it goes. Well, we've, we've followed that tributary down and around, and now we're going to come back into the flow of Mark and chapter 1. And uh, when we, we got there, when we left chapter 1, we were in verse 25, where it says that early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Uh, so we discussed the importance and the, the centrality of prayer in the life of Jesus. Now, if prayer was that important to Jesus, prayer ought to be that important to us. In fact, I pointed out that is the only thing that the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them is, is you know, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the only thing. They just say, teach us to preach, teach us how to cast out demons, teach us how to uh, uh, preach, none of these things. But they did ask, Lord, teach us to pray, because they acquainted this solitary prayer life that Jesus had with that power and authority uh, that they see exhibited in his life. Prayer was that connected link between the Son and the Father, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit is there joining all three together. But at any rate, Jesus is praying. 
But that doesn't stop the crowds, does it? Early in the next morning, uh, you know, back at the house, uh, you know, the crowds are beginning to, to, to press on the house and knock on the door. And uh, that morning they go looking for him. And uh, pressed by the crowds, they felt that they had to find him and bring him back. So we get to Mark chapter 1, verses 36 and, you know, through 39. It said, And Simon and his companions hunted for him. Now, as we were closing yesterday, I mentioned to you that that, that term, uh, katadiako, simply means that it, they, they, they went out you know, with the bloodhounds to track him down. And, uh, you know, not to trap him, but, but you know, it, it's like when you go looking for somebody that's lost, or when you get the tracking dogs out, and you look at all the signs, and you follow them around, and you track him down. That's what they're doing. It's a serious hunt. His followers are pursuing him, and, and they finally overtake him, and they tell him that, you know, in effect, he was the object of a manhunt. It goes on to say, and they found him, and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go somewhere else to the towns nearby, in order that I may preach there also. For that's what I came out for. And he went into their synagogues, other places, other towns throughout Galilee, preaching, and uh, then also, of course, it says, casting out demons. So Jesus is going throughout all Galilee, preaching the gospel in their synagogues, teaching, and, and casting out demons. It doesn't say directly that it was healing, but uh, we can make that, uh, that, that extrapolation. We can go there. That the same thing that happened in Capernaum is be, now being duplicated in all these other towns in and around uh, or in Galilee. Well, let's pray. We get right back into the course of the study. Father, we want to thank you so very much that you have provided us this day shaped, created, fashioned, and given to us in all of our, our various places and in all the things that, uh, that we find ourselves involved in. This is a day you've made. You've made it for your glory. You've made it for our good. Uh, Lord, you have made it as a, a ground for training. Absolutely, Lord. It, you have taken us out on the training field today, uh, as you do every day, that we may learn of you and then practice what it is that we're learning from you. God, I, I thank you for that. What a great uh, method. What a great uh, process that you have put together for us. So I pray, Lord, as we have been looking at, uh, at these things day by day, that you will make each day and each moment of the day a teaching moment for us where we will recognize the work of the Father. We will understand the, uh, the, uh, the, the power of the words of the Son, and we will allow the Holy Spirit to uh, carry through in the action that we need to take. God, we're just going to trust you. We're going to put ourselves uh, upon you, lay upon you, lean ourselves upon you, not on our own understanding, but Lord, lean upon you. And you'll take our, our path, you'll make it straight, you'll show us the way that we ought to go, and you'll even show us the work that you've given us to do today. So here we are to put ourselves in your hands, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that uh, though this isn't uh, uh, you know, just your quiet time of quiet times, but it is uh, a welcoming into the devotional or the quiet times uh, uh, that uh, that I get to spend with the Lord too. At any rate, in in the next scene, in verse forty, we have uh, uh, we have we have an occasion that is first mentioned in in Mark's gospel here. Jesus cleanses a leper. Now we're going to take some time on this verse and on this because this is a key. It's really an important factor in uh, in the ministry that Jesus has. And there's so much that we need to we can learn from the illustrations that are given. And when we go back and pull this out, you know, and and look at it in context and then apply it you know, to uh, our life here and now in our generational uh, uh, construct. In, in verse 40, it says, And a leper came to him, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him. That means he's close enough to kiss the feet of Jesus, all right? Just to give you an idea, that I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. And saying to him, If you are willing, can you? make me clean. 
Now, everything in that verse is significant, so I don't want you to miss a thing. So look at it again. And a leper came to him. All right? Now, we know there are crowds of people around him, right? We, we, we have that picture painted for us. In the midst of this crowd now comes a leper beseeching him, calling out to him, begging him, gets up real close to him, falls on his knees before him, and says to him, if you're willing, can you make me clean? Now, I would ask, has anybody here ever seen a leper? Uh, you can go ahead and, and, and raise your hand, you know, if, if you want to. But uh, uh, I doubt very seriously that uh, many of us, if any of us at all, I've never seen a leper. I did see a leper colony uh, when I was in the Philippines or where there had been one, but I never saw any, uh, any lepers. Probably no one since, uh, you know, it's kind of a disease that is fairly eradicated in our time. We're not too familiar with it. So we need to do a little bit of digging to understand the, uh, the the text and the context from which this is taking place. And then when you find it in other places in Scripture, you'll have that uh, contextual understanding. Let me give you a, a little background information on leprosy in Jesus' day, you know, in this time. Not in our time, but in his time. The Greek word used for leprosy was used for a variety of similar diseases, and some forms were highly contagious. Its symptoms ranged from everything like a psoriasis-like patch on the skin. Now, I know we've all seen psoriasis probably. We certainly see the commercials for psoriasis. Well, in that day, that would be a form of, uh, of leprosy. It would be seen as such. Uh, and it would go all the way to uh, to having running pustule sores, uh, to the to literally to the rotting off of fingers or toes, uh, ears, noses, literally the flesh rotting away at the, at its most extreme. The disease, in its many forms, uh, literally deadens the nerve endings. So a leper could cut himself, or he could burn himself and never realize it. There is uh, forms of that. We have certain uh, uh, diseases that 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 are genetic that people are born with, where they have no physical feeling, no physical sensation. And uh, many times these people never live beyond their childhood because they'll fall down, break a bone, never realize they've broken the bone and get up and that gets infected. Uh, they'll, they'll burn themselves and not notice that they're, they're, they, they burn themselves. And, you know, so, you know, that exists today in, in different forms. It's, it, there's a genetic, and I don't know the name of the genetic disease. If somebody does, they can certainly pop that on there. I would love to, uh, to put it down in my book. I'll go look it up at another time. But, uh, you know, but, but, you know, with leprosy and full blown leprosy, as we, we come to think about it, you know, in Jesus's day, uh, that's that's what would happen. Is the disease was a progressive disease, and it would begin with with uh, with patches on the skin and the, the skin flaking off. Uh, it would become more and more infectious until ultimately it's killing all of the nerve endings uh, to where they had no sensation and no feeling. Uh, Barclay, uh, in his description, uh, describes a leper and what he looks like. He says the whole appearance of the face is changed till a man loses any human appearance and looks, as the ancients said, like a lion or a satyr. They look more animal-like. Uh, they wouldn't be recognizable by their family as the great disease progressed. The nodules would grow larger and larger. They become ulcerated. They would uh, burst and and uh, and seep and other nodules. And so, so their face is becoming completely, and their body completely distorted and uh, and changed by the disease. Uh, they would become, you know, they they would lose, you know, the ability to. Uh, uh, to, to move their eyes back and forth. Their voice would become hoarse. Their breathing would become more like wheezes that could be heard you know, from some distance away because of the ulter, ul, uh, ulcerations on their vocal cords. Uh, their hands, their feet, their, their arms, their limbs would become ulcerated, and slowly the sufferer would become uh, a mass of, of, of growing ulcerated uh, 
pustules, if you will, that would uh, would grow and, and and burst and leak and and uh, uh, it was said that the the odor was tremendous. Uh, uh, so he became, you know, ultimately the average course of the disease was about nine to ten years. Uh, and it would end with mental decay because these uh, growths would get into the brain and 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 you would begin to uh, uh, create those kind of problems. Uh, ultimately, he would just he or she would just simply fall into a coma, and ultimately death would ensue. The sufferer became utterly and completely repulsive, both to himself and to others. Leprosy was a terrifying disease because there was absolutely no known cure. There was nothing they could do. Uh, uh, ritualistic bathing, anything that they did to clean the sores, you know, it just was a progressive disease. So if you can imagine for a moment, if you will, what it would be like if you were told that you had an incurable disease, especially one that was going to change your, your image, that it would become so much so that people couldn't even be around you, and you couldn't even, you couldn't even feel like you could be around yourself. Many of us have friends or family members who have received some kind of news that is, is terminal, uh, the kind that says that you've reached the end stage and your condition is terminal. We've seen you know, multiple responses, anywhere from resignation to fear to anger to depression to denial, sometimes, you know, greatly to the to the grace of God, great joy and and, and a release in life where, where where Christ is just magnified through the whole thing. And and, and it's a blessing. I've i I've, I've had so many friends, I've been able to, to be with them and watch them and, and, and see this yeah, and it could be a blessing, it also could be such a heartache. Uh, when I was diagnosed with cancer some years ago, I was greatly encouraged by my wife, my kids, along with so many of you, uh, my Christian brothers and sisters, my church family, everyone's support meant so much to me and meant so much to our family. I remember that day as I was getting ready to go, you know, in for the surgery, and I'm I'm in that little room, and they've got you prepped, they got you ready to go, and there was a knock on the sheet, if you will, and uh, you know, and it opened up, and there stood my buddy and Julia. I was absolutely overwhelmed that they had flown from Florida to here to spend time with me and be there for my wife and my kids. Guys, you will never know what that means. So and every time I see Buddy and Julia pop up there in the morning, I'm remembered of the deep, incredible, blessed friendship and familyhood that we share together. You'll never know what that morning meant and meant to my family. Now we know, many of us know that kind of support uh, what it was to 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 have you know people that could love you and touch you and hold your hand and pray with you. Well, uh, the sad news here is these lepers not only had a terminal disease, they became social and religious outcasts because of their disease. They had no human touch, nobody to come and hold their hand and pray with them, to touch them on the head and 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 pray over them. They had no one to, to put an arm around and, and to hug them and say, we love you and we're going to be here with you through this. No, they were cast out of their family. They were cast out of their communities. They were cast out of their, their synagogues and, and out of the temple. They were unclean animals that could no longer be fit for, for human habitation. Uh, for the Israelites, leprosy rendered its victims ceremonial unclean, ceremonial unclean, un, the unclean, and unfit to worship God. As far as the people were concerned, they were not out, only outcasts from their family and their society. They were outcasts from God. They were cut off permanently and eternally from God. Leviticus and chapter 13 and... Uh, you know, in, in verse 3, 
it says, if I can get that move forward there, except I move too far forward. In verse 3 it says, and the priest shall look at the mark on the skin of the body. And if the hair in the infection has turned white, and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is an infection of leprosy. And when the priest has looked at him, he shall pronounce him unclean. Now that literally means he is as an unclean animal, and would be driven from the camp. Uh, later on in the 45th and the 46th verse, he says, as for the leper who has the infection in his clothes, his clothes shall be torn and his hair of his head shall be uncovered and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone, and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. And by the literally, by what they're meaning, is not outside the camp. And just some, it, you know, basically they're living in the in the trash heaps outside the camp, where people would come and throw all their garbage and their refuse and everything else. If a person contracted a contagious type, the priest declared him a leper, and he was banished from his home and from his city and from any form of worship. And everywhere he went. He had to, to, to shout out with, a, with, with any voice that he had, unclean, unclean. And if, and if anybody accidentally was, if, if he was off on the side of the road somewhere, uh, you know, just, just, you know, in the shade of a tree and somebody come walking down the road unsuspecting, he would have to yell from his post, unclean, so that person could make a, a, a wide arch around him. There could be no uh, interaction with those people. Anyone who came in contact with a leper was also considered to be unclean until they went through a ritualistic seven-day cleansing process uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to make sure they didn't have the disease and, and they were then declared you know, clean again. The lepers weren't permitted to travel on a roadway, nor could they have any social contact with clean people. Therefore, lepers were isolated from the rest of their community so that the members of the community could maintain their status as worshipers. The leper was sent to live in a community with other lepers until they died. Often those communities, as I said, were on the trash heaps and, the, uh, and, and, and where they threw away all the other garbage within the camp. In short, lepers were religious and social outcasts. So this man, that, that we read about that came to Jesus, not only had a terminal disease, but he was separated from his family and his friends, and yes, separated from God. Now, what does that give you a picture of? Anytime you see a picture of, of, of something or someone that is separated from God, it gives you the picture of, of someone who is living in sin with no relationship with God because uh, they are dead, just like these people were dead to their family, dead to their community, uh, dead to uh, you know everybody around, dead to their religion. You know, they were separated and cut off. A sinner, somebody who has never come to know Christ, is separated from God. So how did they obtain food <laughs> from the trash heaps? Yeah, they ate the, the, the putrid food. There would be times that, that, that family members would, their best show of compassion would be you know, to come and, and, and set food outside in buckets or whether or whatever or you know, for, for them. But there could be no social discourse. There could be no... Uh, you know, so they, they, what they could scur scrounge, what they could get, what, what people who still felt love for them and compassion could get to them, that's what they had to eat. Many, yeah, they would starve to death, uh, literally, because they had no one to care for them. They were totally cut off. So this guy not only had a terminal disease, but he had he was separated from family, from friends, and from God. He was ceremonially unclean, unfit. To worship God. Remember, they had to go to specific places to worship, could never go up to the temple, never approach, never have that kind of intimacy. He was unfit. He was dying. He had no comfort from family, friends, or his church. Uh, he was in every way the most hurting and despised of all human beings. 
Some of you know that pain of rejection, of being alone, and you know how devastating it can be. It, I got to tell you, it touched my heart deeply when when our sweet sister Therese said on on Sunday, I, "I'm lonely. I have no one, no friends, no family. This is you know my and and the church becomes. Please, folks, make sure that uh, that you you let Therese know that she does have family, that she can count on, that is there for her, that she has that that loving familial touch." from a church family. What a blessing. What a blessing. It's a blessing when people are, are you know, God is working in such a way there's just such openness. Uh, late, but I'm here. Debbie, I'm so glad that you're here. Enjoyed your email this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, but but reach out to Teresa. Reach out to Debbie. Reach out to one another. These new folks that have come into the family really need to know. We, we all know uh, the loving nature of the family. We've got these relationships built up, but uh, each one of them, I I look up there and see uh, Rick and Lena and and Debbie and and, and Therese and uh, and Angel and 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 Dan and we we can just go through a list of them. And just the last uh, month, they need to be embraced into the into the family and know that they have a family that is there. Uh, listen. While he was dying and rejected, he was alone. Leprosy serves as a biblical illustration of sin. It shows us how God views sin. Uh, that, uh, that there is no communion with God apart from Jesus Christ. And when we're separated, we're separated. That's, and that's eternal death. Uh, you see, leprosy is the most graphic illustration that we have of what, what, what sin is. Sin defiles the whole body. Sin is ugly and loathsome, and sin is incurable. It contaminates the entire body and brings about eventual death, does it not? But we can't cure sin, can we? It's an incurable disease that we have, but we have a physician, and that's what this story brings out in such a miraculous and wonderful way. That's why we're taking time to look at it, because see, this picture is duplicated over and over in the Gospels and, and, and in the New Testament as we see God is the only one that can deal with our leprous, if you will, condition of sin. The nation of Israel it was pictured uh, by Isaiah as having been defiled with leprosy. Uh, now, they got to this point. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, if you want to mark that down or, you know, just flip over real quick. Uh, you go to you, you go to Psalms and then take a right a few books and you're going to get to Isaiah. Uh, in Isaiah chapter one, verse four through six, it says, "Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly." They have abandoned the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, and they have turned away from him. Where will you be stricken again? As you continue in your rebellion, the, the whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint. Do You see the, the picture that's being painted of Israel uh, that, that Isaiah is talking about. You know, there's there's a patch here that uh, that, that that where where the disease where 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 you where the sickness begins, but it be, but it spreads. And uh, he says, "Where are you be stricken again? Where's it going to pop up again as you continue in your rebellion?" And then in verse six, he says that the uh, the the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing sound in it. All bruises, welts, raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. What a picture. You see, that's what he's saying about apostate Israel at that time. As he's calling them back, you know, into to union, he says, he says, you know, I, I despise your feast days, your sacred solemn assemblies, and all of these because their heart was far from God. He, he's likening them uh, to uh, a person stricken with leprosy. In Leviticus 14 describes the ceremony of, uh, of, of the healed leper went through uh, to be declared clean. Like I said, you know, if, if they saw you know, a psoriasis-like patch on the skin, 
you know, if that was healed up, then they would, would could come back in the community, but there was a, a ceremony they had to go through. And listen to this. It's in the, uh, uh, the 14th chapter of Leviticus and uh, the fifth verse. Eh, go back. My fingers are hard, hard, heavy today. It says, the priest shall also give orders to slay one bird in an earthen well vessel over running or you know, over running water. And that word running is the Hebrew word she, which means living water. So let's put that in there and see if you can grasp the picture that is being painted. The priest shall also give orders to slay one bird in an earthen well vessel over living water. Let that sink in for a minute. You see, the rabbis taught quite scripturally that living water, running water, water that wasn't sitting in a pool stagnant, but running water, living water, was the only type of water that could be used to cleanse three specific types of individuals from ceremonial defilement. One of these was being was that of being a leper. But even also, this was only on the day of their cleansing when the leprosy had already been declared to have left. Oh my, thank you, Sherry, yes. Think about this now. Think about this. You see, after the priest had declared the leprosy had been cured, had been healed, there was a ceremony they had to go through. And part of that had to do with the with the uh, uh, the sacrifice of a bird, but it had to be under living. It could be water rushing down the river, if you will, like we see the living waters of baptism. You you, you know you get all kinds of different pictures, uh, but uh, under a waterfall, however it is, the water had to be moving. It had to be what they considered living water. Well, do you remember when Jesus? Uh, is is standing before the people in John and chapter 7. And in verses 37 through 39, he says, Now on the last day of the great feast, Feast of the Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What a mighty God the earthen crock has. That's right. You know, so consider yourself an earthen vessel, if you will. Consider the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in your behalf and mine. Consider the fact that when you receive him, what does he place within you? He places the Holy Spirit, and out of you will flow rivers of living water. Is that not a wonderful, beautiful picture of having been cleansed of your sin, having been made white as snow? As Isaiah says later in that first chapter, come, let us reason together. Now, my Jehovah Witness friends love to use that as an open door to be able to bring you, you know, the heresies and the unfounded teachings that they give, but they always stop there. God says, let us come and reason together, right? Go to the rest of that verse. Come, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. <sighs> what a picture. Wow. Thank you, Betsy. That's right. That's a wow. It really is. This living water, which Jesus would give to his disciples, which would flow out of them, would do the very same thing in principle, as the natural living water did for the ceremonially unclean, in this instance, being able to cleanse those people in the world who lived in uncleanness and death and who needed God's presence in their life and restore them back into union and unity with God and full worship. Our sin, like leprosy, has separated us from God. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sin has hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. 
So in a spiritual sense, we are all born like these lepers. We are born with a terminal spiritual disease that separates us from God. The cleansing of the leper was a type of the cleansing that was to come after the cross, that the person who was unacceptable to God because of their sin would be cleansed and through that application of the work of the cross would be accepted by God into the community of those who God regards as his people and would receive the promised inheritance in Christ and would begin to experience the presence of God moving in their lives as they had never experienced it before. So that out of us literally will gush forth geysers of living water. Wow. Do you see now while we're taking time to look at detail after detail? Because these principles... These are the principles that, that, that Mark carries throughout his gospel. Truly, all the gospels carry this principle, that God saves sinners. And he paints us a picture of what we are like without him. Now, we're going to need to close here because I, I, I don't want to go on uh, and, and get into the encounter itself. It itself is, is incredibly beautiful. And, and the leper came to him beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Every detail in, we've looked at the leper. Now we're going to look at, at, at his coming to Jesus, his beseeching of Jesus, his falling at his knees, the very words that he says, and we'll look at Jesus' reaction. You see, the opening words are really striking. This leper came to him, beseeching him, begging him, and falling on his knees before him. God, I thank you that you open up a wellspring of life to us. Every time we open up the living word of God, we open up this book that is living and active, that, Lord, is powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide between the joint and the marrow and the spirit and the soul. Lord, you pierce us with it. You cleanse us with it. It is the, the meal, the feast that we have every time we go to it, Lord. It's not just a snack. It is a banquet, and we just thank you for it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you open our heart and mind constantly as we look at it. Strip away the uh, uh, the blood blinders from our eyes, let the scales drop, that we can see what the Spirit of God is saying to us in your word. And the Lord, we may take it to ourselves with understanding and with an understanding heart, and that means to receive it in a way that we are anxious and eager to, to, to practice it, to do it. So Lord, we just come with, with joy upon our heart now. And thank you for the moments that you've given us. And open up to us, Lord, the, the incredible day that you laid before us. Let us be found faithful at the end of the day, having lived this day for you. This is the day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. To you be praise and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You have a great and wonderful day, and we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and we're going to pick up and we're going to run with this. May God bless. We'll see you later.